All right. Well, thank you for uh, coming this morning. I know you had to to dig your way out. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, you just plow through it. I tried to explain that to my wife this morning. I don't need to snow blow the driveway. Just give her, and things will be fine. You know, it, this past week, uh, as we've kind of been reflecting on the, uh, you know, what God has done when we're preparing for the annual general meeting, that causes us to reflect, and then as the daycare was putting together their slideshow and kind of all the different things that have happened, uh, I have to be honest, it's absolutely uh, overwhelming to to just stand back and experience the grace of God, to see how he's at work in us and through us, and to see that when when you realize that through our own human abilities we are unable to accomplish such things, but we'll reach people when we're not doing it in our own abilities and through our own power. And so uh, I just want to encourage you, church. I know that uh, it's been, you know, four and a half years of lots of change and lots of different things, but for a lot of people that don't uh, remember this, I remember us being 65 people and two children. Uh, and, uh, And so... Just the way that God has worked through this and, uh, and really um, just brought people to come to know him and serve our community. I mean, the daycare is licensed for 96 kids. We have 170 kids on our wait list. So it's meeting a deep need in our community. And you know the feedback that I get from, uh, from the community is, man, all churches should do this. Because most church buildings are sitting empty, huge facilities like this and have nothing but a pastor sitting in an office uh, with a little portable heater because the treasurer won't turn the heat on. (laughs) That was the reality four and a half years ago, right? And uh, and is the reality in a lot of different churches. And so uh, be encouraged by that. Be encouraged by seeing the Spirit work through us and in us. And the other thing I want to encourage you of is be transformed. Be renewed. Let the Spirit take the bitterness out of your heart. Let the Spirit take the things that you've struggled with because that's not not of God. You're allowing other spirits to to cause bitterness and cause different things in your hearts, and you need to let go of that if you want to be transformed. And so over the past two weeks, we've been looking at what the Scriptures teach us regarding the third member of, of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And you'll see that I'm sitting down today, and there's a reason for that. We've been doing a sermon series on the Holy Spirit, and I get a little bit passionate about it. And so uh, by sitting down, it grounds me a little bit. Now, I can't promise that the table won't go flying and, and, and that I won't get a little excited, but at least by sitting down, I can you know, go a little bit more into teacher mode and, uh, and just walk you through a conversation about the Holy Spirit, the third member of the the Trinity. And this this week, we're going to look at what Scripture teaches us regarding spiritual gifts, which is a real passion of mine, hence why I'm sitting. Some of us call them the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, I've said in both of my sermons so far, and I want to remind you of this again, the approach that I'm taking to this series is not a denominational or a charismatic approach. I'm not teaching what certain denominations or certain movements teach us about the Holy Spirit. What I'm concerned about is what Scripture teaches us. And so I've tried to to set aside in theology what we call presuppositions. So we're not fully able to do that, but I've tried to set aside as much of my presuppositions Uh, as possible to just dig into what does the Bible say about these issues. There's a lot of stuff out there that comes with this subject. And a lot of stuff that comes with this subject has caused some of us to really stray away from the subject. There's entire denominations that deny the existence of the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Bible. And they call them cessationalists. They, they believe that the gifts cease, that they no longer happen anymore. And this, this battle in the church that's happened when it, in regards to the third person of the Trinity 
has caused a lot of confusion and a lot of people to kind of step back and go, whoa, like I'm a little scared of that. And so then we don't allow the Spirit to work in our lives. And last week, I talked about quenching the Spirit. And so we do that. We quench the Spirit out of fear of losing control. And a lot of that is rooted in the things that we've seen, the things that we've maybe uh, experienced, and the things that we just don't want to experience. The problem is, is that this is really unfortunate because I've been trying to show us over the past few weeks that the church was founded through the coming of the Holy Spirit. No Holy Spirit, no church. That the scriptures were written by the Holy Spirit through divine inspiration. No Holy Spirit, no Bible. The Holy Spirit is the cog in the wheel that helps the church be what Jesus called it to be. The Spirit is what helps the church live on mission, kind of like what Natalie was talking about this morning. The Spirit is what helps the church live on mission. In other words, if a church neglects the workings of the Spirit, I would question, and I think that Scripture makes a strong case to question, if such a church is a church at all. Just because people gather together and verbally claim to be in Christ doesn't mean that they represent Christ at all. Often in North American culture, many churches are actually just a social democracy with a religious system of ethics that they claim to follow. There's nothing about them that represents or lives the mission of the church that Jesus founded. The coming of the Holy Spirit in, in Acts 2 launches the church uh, into its Jesus-given mission. What's that mission, you ask? It's to be, it starts with the Abrahamic covenant, actually. It's to be a blessing to the nations, to make disciples that make disciples, to baptize and teach others to live like Jesus lived. If a church is not seeing lives transformed, if disciples are not being made, then it's a fair question to question if it's at church at all. One of these days I'll do a little bit more teaching on that subject. What is a church? What is the mission of the church? But I want you to understand one simple thing. A church that shows no evidence of the fruits of the Spirit, a church that doesn't love others unconditionally, is not a church on mission. It's not a Spirit-filled church. It's a club. It's a club that enjoys democracy. And that's it. Now, the Apostle Paul actually deals with these exact issues. This is not mind-blowing. This was happening in the early church. And so he deals with these exact issues in a lot of his letters. The first passage that we're going to discuss on spiritual gifts this morning is a good example of this. So there's four key passages in the New Testament. There is some in the Old Testament as well, but I'm going to focus specifically on the New Covenant, the New Testament, this morning. There's four passages that teach us about the gifts of the Spirit. And so this morning, we're going to take a brief look at each of these four passages. I stress a brief look because I don't want to miss lunch. In 1 Corinthians, Paul is dealing with a church that thinks they are extremely spiritual. So you can open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's where we're going to start, and then we're going to jump over to Romans, then Ephesians, and then 1 Peter. The, the church in Corinth, the, the, the city of Corinth was a, a thriving metropolis. And the, the church in Corinth, they really thought that they were an amazing, spiritually healthy church. They were a large church. They had one of the most gifted preachers, Apollos. 
And we hear in the early onset of the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, this debate about who should the people follow? Should we follow Paul? Should we follow Apollos? And what Paul says is, no, you should be following Jesus. But Apollos was that, that preacher that attracted people. People wanted to hear what he had to say. I want you to picture it like this. They were that big church with the amazing worship team, the amazing lights, the, the, the you know, uh, amazing preacher, amazing entertainment. You could be a spectator in the church of Corinth and, and speak in tongues and, and really experience the gifts. The problem is, is that Paul's actually very frustrated with this church. And you see in scripture, it's one of the churches he gets the most frustrated with. So why would he be so frustrated with a church that seems so awesome? Because the reality is, is that on the surface it looks awesome, but in reality their spirituality is null and void. He's frustrated because they are not living on mission. The church in Corinth has become all about the church in Corinth, not about the mission that Jesus gave the church to live. To Paul, what you need to understand, to Paul, to the Apostle Paul, mission is everything. The church in Corinth practiced spiritual gifts, but they'd made the gifts all about themselves. And so Paul leads into his correction concerning the gifts like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, he simply says this, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters... I do not want you to be uninformed. I'm going to point out something really obvious. You don't need a theological degree to understand this. If, they, if he says, I don't want you to be uninformed, it means they are. <coughs> Real neat trick in Scripture. I don't want you to be uninformed, meaning you seem uninformed, and we need to change that. Paul needs to teach them, to inform them how the gifts of the Spirit actually work compared to how they are functioning in the gifts as a church. Now, you have to understand something about the early church and about Paul's thinking. Uh, the way that he thinks, the way that he tracks is all about mission. And the Holy Spirit was not just a concept to the apostles and to those who followed Jesus. The Holy Spirit, I want you to hear this, the Holy Spirit was an experienced reality. I'll say that again. The Holy Spirit was not just a concept to the apostles. The Holy Spirit was an experienced reality. They walked by the Spirit. They followed the leading of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit was central to how they understood God and their calling to make disciples, to heal, to see lives transformed by the preaching of the gospel. So this subject is extremely important to Paul, and he doesn't want the Corinthians to be uninformed. It's, it's central to what he understands for, for the churches and how they live and how they be on mission. So when he says, I don't want you to be uninformed, what Paul's saying is, this is really important. It's important that you understand this so that you can be a church on mission, not a club with a democracy. Paul goes on to speak a little bit about these gifts. If we jump to chapter to verse 4 in chapter 12. He says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. I'm going to reread that. To each one, it doesn't say to a select few. To each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for what? The common good. Notice it doesn't say for your good. It says for the common good. This is the correction that Paul's bringing. 
To one, there is given the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And then listen to what he says here. And he distributes them to each one, just as, underline and circle, he determines. You need, you need to underline and circle that. He distributes these gifts, these charismatic gifts, to each one just as he determines, not as we determine. Now, in this passage, what Paul is really stressing is that the gifts of the Spirit all have the same origin. That's what he starts off with. The origin is within the true Ein God, the Holy, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These gifts that Paul lists in this passage, derived from the Greek word charismata. This is where our English word charismatic comes from. These, this list, are the charismatic gifts that have caused so much debate in the church. And Paul tells us that there, there's a diversity of gifts, a diversity of purposes for these gifts, and a diversity of activities linked to the gifts. But the important thing to understand is that these, derived, these diverse gifts are manifestations of the Spirit for the common good. In the church in Corinth, people who used these gifts thought that they were more important than those who didn't. Paul is correcting this drastic mistake. You see, when you think that because of something God has given you in a moment makes you more special than anybody else, you are drastically wrong. We are equally sinners. Paul would say, actually, he's the worst of all sinners. That's Paul's way of stressing we're all in sin. None of us in this room are better than anyone else because of any gift that we possess or any gift that we have been given. But in Corinth, that's what they're doing. They're acting like so-and-so is more important than so-and-so. Now, he lists these, these gifts as something that the Spirit gives for the common good, which means it's important to achieve the common good, to build up the body, he says. The general purpose of all spiritual gifts is, the is to benefit all Christians in the local congregation. Not to benefit one Christian or a small group of Christians, but to benefit all Christians in the local congregation. So he lists these charismatic gifts off. And so I'm going to do a little Greek work for you. Are you excited about that? When he says things like the message of wisdom, in the Greek text, it actually speaks a little broader than that. So I'm going to uh, sort of help you understand in the Greek how uh, this can be interpreted of what he means. Because, you know, some people are like, you know, I have the gift of wisdom, meaning I'm like really smart. I'm actually smarter than everybody else. You should hear what I have to say because I'm the wise one of Evergreen Heights Christian Fellowship. The problem is, is in the Greek, the message of wisdom, notice he says that, the message of wisdom, is about revealing what God did on the cross through Christ. All these gifts are about pointing people to the cross, pointing people to Jesus. And when he says message of knowledge, essentially what he's talking about is like a theological rationale for decisions concerning Christian living. 
So when somebody is given a message of wisdom, it is always a message that is about revealing God through the cross of Christ. When someone is given a message of knowledge, it is always about or something to help with a decision concerning Christian living. And he says some are given the gift of faith. What he's talking about there is this bold faith of trusting in God with amazing confidence. You're like that person that you're like, nothing you do makes sense because you're doing it in faith. That's what he's talking about here. And then the gift of healing, well, that just means the gift of healing. Nothing overly greek there. The sick get healed. The wounded get healed. And miraculous powers. Like, wouldn't you love to just have miraculous... Like, I am secretly Captain America. <laughs> We've established this several years ago, that I am secretly Captain America. I know, I know, I hide the chiseled chest well. You know, the abs are not as obvious as they could be, but it's all part of my disguise. I am secretly Captain America. I have miraculous powers. That's not what he means, is it? He's not talking about having a gift of being a superhero. What he's talking about is a gift, the powers to be able to drive out demons, to overcome bondage in one's life. The charismatic gifts are gifts that are given when and how the Spirit decides. And they're always given to point people to Jesus and to show the power of the cross. They are not about the person receiving the gift. It's about the people around that person. In other words, these gifts are given when needed to meet a specific purpose when needed. They are given to serve others, Paul says. A man by the name of J.I. Packer, a few people might know of him. If you don't, you probably don't know anything about theology. He's probably one of the biggest heavyweights, and he is Canadian. He says this in his Concise Theology, A Guide to Historic Christian belief. We all have that textbook on our shelves, right? This is what he says. He says, a spiritual gift is an ability in some way to express, celebrate, display, and so communicate Christ. We are told that gifts, rightly used, that would mean that they can be wrongly used, build up Christians and churches. So no gift is to ever tear somebody down. It's always about building up. But only knowledge of God in Christ builds up. I love what he does there. It's only knowledge of God in Christ that can build you up. So each charisma must be an ability from Christ to show and share Christ in an upbuilding way. It's amazing to know that God will empower Christians to have the right words to say in the right moment if they're living by the Spirit. It's amazing to know that we can have big faith, that God will give us big faith if we live by the Spirit, if we seek the Spirit in our lives, that He will give us big faith when needed, that He'll give us the ability to stand against evil and show the power of the cross when we need it the most. That is incredibly comforting to me to know that God will give me these gifts in the moments that I need it to show someone else who Jesus is. Because that's the mission of the church. Now the second passage in the New Testament that addresses spiritual gifts is in the book of Romans, again, another writing by Paul. And Paul takes us uh, into a different set of gifts in this passage. In Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 3, listen to what Paul says. 
For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. Again, we're going to do amazing theology here. Usually people say that because people are. So don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, because some people are, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment. In accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you, for just as each of us has one body with many parts, sorry, with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. I want you to remember that as we journey through this. There's a body with many parts, and not any one person moves beyond one body part. So in Christ, we, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. I love how blunt Paul is. So if you have a gift of teaching, for the love of God, teach. What's holding you back? If you, have, if you have a gift to serve, why are you not serving? That's, that's the way that this reads. If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, now that would assume that not everybody can lead. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, I love this, do it cheerfully. In other words, don't wrap your arms around somebody and get all woe is me with them. Give mercy with a cheerful, joy-filled heart. In this passage, Paul, I got to sit down. Here we go. In this passage, Paul is calling the people to humble service in the church. Humility is a key concept to using your gifts. There's one body with many different gifts. Not everyone has the same function, but when each of us finds and functions in our spiritual gift, the church is built up. That's what Paul's saying. In this passage, Paul lists more common gifts and encourages people to live in their gifting. Not try to function outside of your gifts. In other words, if you're not a leader, don't go into a leadership role. You'll burn out, you'll crash, you'll burn. He says, if your gift is teach, is to teach, then teach. In other words, if your gift is to show mercy, show mercy. Don't try to teach. Oh, and cheerfully function in your gift. (laughs) I'm going to say that again. Cheerfully, happy, smiles, engagement. It's awesome. Have a little joy. Be excited that God has gifted you with something. Just use what you have been given for the common good. The Lexham Survey of Theology, another great big thick textbook that I'm sure we're all going to run out and buy. It says this about spiritual gifts in the church. Spiritual gifts are abilities given to individual believers by the Holy Spirit in order to equip God's people for ministry, both for the edification of the church and for God's salvific mission. There it is. For God's salvific mission mission to the world. So to edify the church, to build the church up so that the church can launch into spreading the good news of Christ. That's the salvific, the saving mission to the world. The gifts that Paul addresses in this passage are more common gifts than the charismatic gifts. These are the gifts that fill out the body, and each person has one and should be using it for the glory of God, for the church to carry out its call, edifying 
the edification of the church and God's salvific mission to the world. The gifts are always about the church being on mission. Remember, if the church is not on mission, it's just a club with democracy. Great potlucks. We're all friends. But it's not on mission. It's not reaching anybody. There's nothing salvific about what the church is doing. I know in North America, this really gets to, like, this really bugs us, right? Because we're like, no, the church is for me. Like, I want a group of people that love me and care for me and need me. But that is not what the church was made for. The church was made for Christ. And he's invited you into it, I don't know, by giving you eternal life, by dying for your sins, Then Paul moves into this weird section that a lot of people really struggle with too. And these are the gifts that equip the people. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 to 12, Paul says this. I should probably turn there so he can say it. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, now he's going to quote the Old Testament. When he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Some big theological statements there. So Christ himself, now what he's going to do is he's actually going to tell you about what what we call the offices, the gift that the Holy Spirit has given to the church. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Now, in the Greek text, it's interesting in the English text, we separate pastors and teachers. In the Greek text, it's like a slash. It's not literally because they don't have that. Pastors, teachers are the same thing. Now, in our North American culture, we don't see it that way. We define pastor as a shepherd. That's the word that it uses there, but it ties shepherd in with teacher. And he says, what are these people for? Why has the Holy Spirit gifted these people to the church? So he's empowered these people. He's called them out to hold this office And their role is this, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. That's very different than how we define a shepherd. But if you look at what a shepherd does, a shepherd leads the flock. A shepherd corrects and guides the flock. Because the flock falls into holes sporadically. So the Holy Spirit is given special gifts to specific people so that they can equip the saints. I'm going to say that again. The Holy Spirit has given specific gifts to specific people so that they can equip the saints. Paul says that these are people whose role is to use their gift to equip the church for works of service so that the body of Christ, the church, may be built up. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, teachers is a gift from the Holy Spirit to the church for this simple purpose. Now, there's something connected to this that you need to understand. These are specific callings or offices that are held in the Christian community. We see it saturated through the book of Acts. The people who have these callings, though, Scripture is very clear, are judged more strictly than others in the church because of their level of influence. In other words, you do not want to be an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, or a pastor or teacher if you're not called to be. 
Because someone like myself, I know I'm accountable to you and I know I'm accountable to the elders, but guess what? I'm accountable to God. He kind of trumps you. And so I have to do what God leads through his Holy Spirit. And I know that that's not always what people want to do. But I'm judged more strictly than you. And I take that extremely serious. You're really quiet. (laughs) The way that he talks about these these people, is that they're a gift to you. Embrace the gift. Embrace it. Because obviously, Scripture says you need it. Now the fourth passage, I'll stop beating that horse. The fourth passage that addresses spiritual gifts rounds out the subject really nicely. This time, it's not Paul, it's Peter who brings us teaching on this subject. Peter says that each of us are gifted to serve. In Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 4, starting at verse 10, he says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others. Pretty blunt statement, right? You've received a gift, use it to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. (laughs) Think about that for a second. Think about that. Does that change what you might think about saying? It sure does for me. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so, listen to this, with the strength God provides. He strengthens you while you serve. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Do you see what it's all about? Jesus. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Use your gifts to serve others. Peter said that is being a faithful steward of God's grace. Whenever you speak, you do it as one who speaks the very words of God. So be careful the words you use. Be careful about what you complain about. Be careful how you speak to others. We're to serve with our gifts with great strength. Strength that God provides. That's important to understand, folks. We serve with great strength, but it's not our own strength. It's the strength that God provides for us so that Jesus can be praised because it's all about Jesus. God has given every church, this church, everything it needs to be on mission, everything it needs to be amazing. If we're falling short of being like Jesus as a church, it's because not everyone is using their gifts to serve others, to build up others to show others the way of Jesus. It's so important that everyone in the body of Christ uses their gifts for the glory of Christ. Unfortunately, not everyone does this, and so we fall short. I often hear people say that they don't don't know what their gift is. I can't figure out what my spiritual gift is. And so they don't know how to go about serving because they didn't take the right test or or they just can't seem to understand what their gift is. I struggle with this for several reasons. Firstly, as one learns to listen to the Spirit, to be filled by the Spirit, so my previous two messages are very important to understanding this message, your gifts will be revealed to you through the Spirit. If we as a church would tune into the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't have any issue with knowing our gifts. Secondly, why I struggle with this is that many of us use our gifts every day, but we use them for our benefit and our glory. 
And for some reason, when we come into the church, we act like those aren't our gifts and we must have some other holy gift. It's really interesting to me how I watch people using their gifts all the time and then I say, hey, do you want to serve in this area of the church? Oh, I don't feel called to that. <laughs> it's like you're waiting for some kind of holy moment to happen to be like, oh, you have the gift of prophecy. No, it's much simpler than that. And, and, and I know people are going to get angry, angry at me for saying this because you struggle with figuring out what your gifts are, but folks, the Bible is not trying to be trickery. God wants you to understand every word of this. God deeply wants you to know what your spiritual gift is. He's probably revealed it to you 10 times just today. But when we're not hearing the Spirit, when we're not listening to the Spirit, when we're not seeking the Spirit in our lives, when we want to be in control and we want to know everything that's happening, you will not know your spiritual gift because you're not hearing it. And I get it. I quench the Spirit sometimes. There's often times where I'm like, you know what, God, I know better. I get it. We're all like that. You need to understand that, folks. I'm not beating up any individual people in here. We are all like that. We will all quench the Spirit. We will all not listen to the Spirit. But I just I want to simplify this for you. Many times, actually most of the time, your gifts are obvious. Sometimes they're things you're just naturally good at. Now, I do want you to understand not necessarily but they're things that you have a passion for. Let me explain this. We will naturally benefit from our gifts. There's nothing wrong with that. So just because our gifts are all about Jesus doesn't mean we don't at times benefit from those gifts. There's nothing wrong with that. But they were given to you for the benefit of others. And so we need to use our gift to serve. So if you're only using your gift to serve you, you're missing the point. There's one caution I'd like to throw out there. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean it's your spiritual gift. There are people who are by career teachers. We have some in this room. But just because you're a teacher by career doesn't actually mean that your spiritual gift is teaching. It doesn't make you a bad teacher. You might be an amazing teacher. But it doesn't mean that it's necessarily your spiritual gift. Spiritual gifts are something that burns inside you. Something that you would feel empty without. I, I call it a holy discontent. It's, it's not about making money. It's not about a career. It's something that you know you need to do. Like, for example... When you see injustice and you can't help but have compassion or mercy for the person suffering the injustice. No matter how hard you try, you just can't ignore it. It keeps you up at night. There's somebody in here right now saying, yeah, I live that all the time. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's telling you something. You have the gift of mercy. So go show mercy to the person suffering. That's really what these passages are saying. Don't analyze it. Don't overthink it. Just go and do it. It's your gift. So that's something that you, you just, you know, the, the, you see someone suffering injustice and you just can't help but be bothered by it, but then you talk yourself out of doing anything about it, right? Oh, I don't want to get, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to, uh, no, just do it. Don't call me the one with the gift of teaching to go do it because I don't have any mercy. <laughs> it's interesting though, isn't it? Because the pastors and teachers have been given as a gift to you to equip you, but yet we want me to have all the gifts. And then we're like, he's not compassionate enough. No, it's not my gift. I have a wife who loves people. 
Isn't it interesting how God does that? I'm not, I'm not, it's funny, but it's true. <laughs> Carrie has a gift of mercy and compassion. I don't. Where was I? Teaching. Oh, yeah, that thing. All right. God doesn't keep your gift a secret. Wouldn't that be cruel if he's like, I'm really going to make him work for this? Right? It's like the, the Trinity's up there laughing at us. <laughs> Did you see Steve trying to figure out his gift? Wasn't that funny? That's not how this works. He wants you to know. He's already told you. He wants you to know so you can play your role in the body to help with the mission. If you think something is missing in our church, then you're the person God has given the passion for whatever that is. So you need to be the person that finds those with the gift of leadership. Because just because you have an idea doesn't mean you're equipped to lead it. See, nothing can be a Lone Ranger thing. Nothing can be like your gig, your thing. This is my ministry. This is my thing. You don't have all the gifts. You need to surround yourselves with other gifted people in order for those ministries to happen with health. Our gifts are given for the common good. We need to use them so the body is complete. We also need to know what gifts we have and what gifts we don't have. Don't try to be a pastor if you're not gifted to teach and lead. A shepherd leads a flock, like I said, and often giving hard correction and guidance to stubborn sheep who don't want to be led. I should delete that. <laughs> if it's not your gift, you won't last. I'm going to say that again. If it's not your gift, you won't last. You'll burn out and you'll quit. I'm going to tell you a little secret, and my wife's going to get really mad at me for telling you this. <laughs> my resignation letter is ready to be printed at all moments. Now, why, why, do, I, why do I say that? Because there's things about a gift of pastoring that in the human realm of things are incredibly difficult. Because you're accountable to people, you're accountable to boards, you're accountable to God for everything you say, for everything you do. I get, I get wonderful emails critiquing things that my children have done at school. If I wasn't called to do this job, I would burn out and I would quit. And so I write this letter, I, I've done it everywhere I've ever been, and it's ready to print, and some days I even go as far as printing it. Check the recycle bin someday. <laughs> and the reason that it ends up in the recycle bin, folks, is because he strengthens me. And so whenever I'm ready to quit, whenever I'm feeling burnt out, what I know is... I'm straying from God. I'm not where I need to be in my faith because God will strengthen me to serve how he's called me to serve at all times. And so what I need to do is aim for correction in my life so that I can hear the Spirit in my life so that I can get strengthened and back on track so I don't quit because this is what God's called me to do. Our spiritual gifts are exactly like that. Whenever we're burning out, whenever we're not, you know, we've just had enough, it's because we're doing it with our own strength and our own ability. And we need to draw closer to the provider of those gifts. Because he strengthens. Isn't that what he said? He strengthens you to be on God's mission, to edify and build the body of Christ. The worship team can join me up here. God will give you the strength, Peter says, to live your gift. Accept your gift. 
Play your role for the common good of the body of Christ. And always remember what the mission is. I'll remind you to bless others, to share Christ, to build people up, and to love unconditionally. We need each other. We need all the parts working together. This is how the church will live on mission. It's not about us individually. It's about us coming together to form the body. And Christ is the head. It's all about Jesus. Here's the big idea. You waited a long time for this. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are given as the Spirit chooses with the purpose of building up the church and glorifying Christ. The people of Christ are called to respond to their Spirit-given gift with acts of service for others. When the body uses its gifts, the body thrives, grows, and flourishes. So we need to listen to the nudgings of the Spirit in our lives and learn to respond with obedience.